Hello and welcome back to another episode of LMS Cast. My name is Chris Badgett, and today we're joined by Bjork Ostrom from Pinch of Yum and Food Blogger Pro and WP Tasty. How are you doing, Bjork? I'm doing great, Chris. Yeah, super excited to be here and to uh, chat with you about anything and everything. All topics are on the table for us. That's awesome. So Bjork is is a creator of a membership site, a blog, and um, inside that membership membership site are courses. And he's built quite a large community. And I wanted to bring him on the show for you all so that you can kind of learn some tips and tricks and 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 just learn from Bjork's um, experience. So we'll just get into some details around that. But it, my understanding is it all started with just a blog, Pinch of Yum, a, a food yeah, blog. Like what was, sure. your, what was your journey from starting blogging, getting into deciding to build a, a membership site? Yes. Uh, many moons ago. Uh, it was probably six going on seven years ago. So this was 2010, April of 2010. Um, my wife, Lindsay, who was a teacher at the time, I was working at a nonprofit, um, said, you know, I'm super interested in getting interested in food recipes. And, you know, we had been married uh, about a year. And so for the first time, she was cooking for, you know, two people instead of just herself. And she's starting to get interested more and more in recipes. So she was posting those to social media and things like that. And at one point, she was like, ah, I think that people that are following me, kind of friends and family, might be getting a little bit annoyed by how enthusiastic I am about sharing these recipes. Um, and so we were like, well, maybe there's a better place for that. And that's when we had this blog conversation. And so at the time, I, w- I was really into and still am into audiobooks and podcasts. And I'm like the people that are listening to this right now. It's like information junkies, right? I love that stuff. And I was listening to Crush It by Gary Vaynerchuk, which was like a perfect book for me to be listening to at the time. Um, And I hadn't like focused in on online business. It was really just like business in general, but I saw this one come up as recommended and I was listening to it. And so that kind of planted the seed or the idea for creating a blog. So back in 2010, April, 2010, uh, we started pinch of yum on a Tumblr blog. And at the time we were like, we didn't know what was going on. And so we'd post some photos and then Lindsay would post the recipe in a different post. And, uh, we were just totally clueless to the process. Um, but to do like a super fast forward, uh, through the story, we won't spend too much time on it, but, um, it was little by little, um, day by day, um, step by step that we started to figure it out. And, uh, it's interesting to do these interviews because I'm telling it from my perspective, uh, but a huge, huge part of it is Lindsay and her time and energy and creating the content, figuring out photography, testing the recipes, um, and building it up uh, over time and figuring out how do we get more people to engage? How do we get more comments on it? And uh, over time, we slowly but surely built it up. We eventually switched to WordPress, which is what we're, what we're running the blog off of now. Um, and that's really been our story. It's, it's been a story of like every day showing up and figuring out in really small ways, how can we make this a little bit better and improve it? But it all started back in 2010 with Lindsay saying, hey, I want to post some recipes online. That's awesome. Well, yeah, continuous improvement is what it's all about. I mean, it's easy to look at a membership site or a successful blog and and just want that, but there's mm-hmm. six or seven years of hard work and yes. you're not doing it alone. You're doing it with Lindsay. Yep. And you're you're committed to continuously improving things. Well, those are yeah, those are all such important things for people to consider because my assumption would be people that are listening to this. There's a percentage of people that are really successful with their site and they're, and they're wanting to turn it up, right? They're wanting to amplify their success. But there's also a portion of people that are listening to this that want that, that haven't yet gotten it and feel like in some way they're maybe inadequate because they look at other people that are really successful and then they're like, what am I doing wrong? And a lot of times it's just patience. It's sticking with it and showing up every day, even when it feels like you're only you know, pushing the boulder a little bit. And the reason is because those people are on the other side of the hill, right? So they're like pushing the boulder up still. And they're like, this is so much work. (laughs) I stop, I get crushed by this boulder. Um, But what they don't realize is there will be a point where they get to the top of the hill and and the, the incline changes. So maybe it just goes to a plateau or maybe it even goes down a little bit where like 
they push the boulder and then it rolls on its own a little bit, but it takes a long time to get to that point. So for those that are listening, I would encourage you to continue to make small improvements every t- every day, um, to not show up and do the same thing, to find ways to make improvements, uh, but to stick with it for a long period of time because it does take a lot of time. That's awesome. Well, before we get into courses and membership site, what are some key takeaways that you learned that make the difference between a average blog and a more successful um, yeah. blog? Like what, what did you find out in that time in blogging? To like- yeah, for sure. The biggest thing is just how much time it takes to produce high quality content. I think that a mindset that people can often have with content is you can go in and do something really quick and publish it. And then you check the content box. Like I'm doing content marketing or I'm creating content, but it's, if you have, let's say three posts that you're doing and they're those kind of like, um, half effort posts where you're going in and checking the content marketing box, it's better to combine the time that you're, you're using for those three posts to do one really in-depth, super high quality content post, um, as opposed to spreading that out and feeling like you're doing the right thing because you're producing a bunch of content. It takes so much time to produce something that people are going to, that's going to be helpful, that people are going to engage with and that people are going to share. Like if you really think about what it takes to share a post or content, um, it's really rare to do, right? Think about all the content that you read and consume and how little of that you actually share. It's because there's this like one, two, 3% range where it has to be top notch. Um, and it just takes so much time and energy. It's, I think it's harder than most people really realize. That's a really good point. Yeah. It, uh, checking the content box. I like that. Like, okay, I'm going to write my 500 word post for today. Like, yes. That's not the, that's not the approach to take. And I know when I'm blog that, um, you know, if I, if I'm going to really get excited about a post, I need to, it's going to take days to make it. Yeah. It's going to be images. There's going to be video in there. There's going to be a lot of links in there. There's going to yep. be research. It's a lot of work, but that's how you make good content. Right. Yep. And that type of content can give back exponentially and it, over a long yeah. period of time, depending yeah. on your industry, right? If it's tech, like you're going to post something and it might be the iPhone six and then it's outdated in six months or a year. But in general, the uh, type of content um, that is longer form type of content that maybe you go back and update, you know, throughout, that's going to be content that's going to continue to give back. Um, and it's well worth the time and energy. But the hard part is, especially in those early stages, when you're doing it, and it doesn't feel like anybody's there. Like that's, that's the difficult phase to break through is when you're working another job and using your free time that you'd usually watch Game of Thrones or hang out with your friends to like do this side hustle and you're not getting any engagement or interaction with that. And, and knowing that you have to put in on the content side, at least, I think this is really too true, like a year or two years Um, If you're doing a strictly content-based business or doing content marketing, there's a real long tail, long-term payoff with it. Um, Obviously, there's other things that you can be doing with online business, right? Like there's infinite number of ways that you can create a business and some of those can scale really quickly if you're using advertising and and, uh, you have a budget to spend money on advertising to create income from a product. And if there's a margin there, you could do that in a month, right? But if we're talking specifically about content, it's a really long-term game and you have to pay your dues with it for sure. A lot lot of sweat equity. That's awesome. And if you're listening to this and you're like, I just want to make online courses or make my membership site and focus content there. I think not doing a blog of any kind, even if you just post four times a year, you're Mm -hmm. doing a disservice. In fact, I don't know if the listeners know this, but the reason uh, Lifter LMS, the product is here, our WordPress plugin for making courses, it all started from a blog post I wrote when I first started building an online course website with WordPress. I was really passionate about it and just sharing like what I was doing and how it worked and everything. And that blog post kind of went viral. I wrote a lot of posts that not many people checked out, but that post took off like, Oh, there's a real need here. Yep. Maybe I'll start offering services, helping other people who are trying to figure this out, do it. And then later ended up building a product on top of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah one blog post that I wrote at two o'clock in the morning Yeah, four, four years ago. <laughs> yeah. It's, we talk about it as one hit wonders, right? It's like yeah. a band yeah. and you hear the story of the Beatles and you're like, Oh God, they were awesome. And the only thing they did was write hit songs. And in a way, yes, like later on. Um, but 
what you don't realize is like there's hours and hours and hours and hours of time and energy spent like writing songs. And it's, I think it's true across the board with musicians. If you look at them, like they'll write a hundred songs, a thousand songs, um, record hundreds. And one of those will be the song that like makes them as an artist. And then as they go, maybe they'll add to that repertoire if they're really lucky. I think you'll, when you look at blogs or if you look at content based sites, um, it's very similar, right? You'll have your, your hits and then you'll have like your supporting cast of content and you need that supporting content in order to have the hits. You need to pay your dues writing those songs, quote unquote, in order to have the hits. But I would guess if you look at, you know, 99% of websites, they'll, they'll be 10 to 20% of their content will be driving, you know, 80 to 90% of the traffic. Um, and your example is a great example of that. Like you paid your dues and wrote a lot of content. Um, and that didn't necessarily drive a lot of traffic, but if you hadn't done that, you wouldn't have gotten to this point where you produce that one piece of content that really changed the trajectory of your career and your business and your life. life. Yeah. 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 And before that post across multiple websites on different topics, I'd probably written a couple hundred blog posts. Right. It was just exactly. that, that one took off. I started getting phone calls for yep. work. It was just boom. Yeah. <laughs> people were taking pictures of you on the street. You're showing up on people magazine. Not quite that much. I don't oh, get okay. recognized on the street. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's cool. Well, well, let's talk a little bit about the food blogger niche. It's um, to me, that sounds like, like uh, it sounds kind of intimidating because the, f you know, what a massive niche, like how yeah. do you differentiate, how do you, how do you compete? And mm -hmm. so I know you focused a lot on uh, creating high quality content, but yeah. how, do you, how did you differentiate or what became, how did your brand emerge? In yeah. So that's a great niche. question. For sure. So I think that there's, for us specifically, we're a unique uh, use case or example of a site because one of the unique things that we come to the table with for Pinch of Yum is Lindsay has this skill of food, developing recipes, and also this deep interest in the art of the process, both the writing and the photography. She really enjoys both of those things. And I come from the standpoint of being really interested in the tech side of it, right? So like monetization and marketing and things like that. Um, and we're working on it together. So it's this really unique combination where we cover a lot of the, um, the different like uh, areas that, uh, that a content food content site would be focusing on. And for that reason, um, pinch of yum itself in some ways has become a place for people to go to learn about blogging. And that's just due to some of the decisions we made early on. I would write reports once a month and say, here's the things that we're learning about building a blog. So in some ways, the pinch of yum niche is like recipes and food. And it's also a niche with like us being interested in the blogging space. I think one of the things that people often think about is like, oh, you must get a ton of traffic when you do photography posts. And if you do, you know, the reports that you do each month, but in reality, we, I crunched these numbers maybe six months ago. It's like one to two percent of the traffic to Pinch of Yum is those is, is that content is are those posts, um, and the vast majority of it is the recipes themselves. But in terms of like carving out a niche for ourselves, that's kind of what it's done, uh, or that's kind of what we've done. Um, but I'd recommend to people that are getting into the food niche. Um, is that they find their own niche. And the reason is because if you're just gonna do like broad recipe um, posting, it's gonna be really, really difficult because you're gonna be competing against things like All Recipes or Martha Stewart or things like that, uh, sites like that. But one of the things that's really exciting about the food niche is there's so many different niches within the food niche, right? There's real food, there's uh, dietary restrictions, paleo, there's um, you know specific types of food. You could do like, all meat recipes, right? You could be the grill guy. Like there's so many niches within the food niche, um, the broader food niche that that's, would my, my, that's my encouragement to people that would be getting into it or that are starting is to really claim a, a specific niche um, that's not super, super small, right? You don't want to be the red velvet cupcake blog, but um, niche enough that people can go to you and say like, oh, I understand what you are. And I know that I can come to you to meet specific needs. So an example would be we have Baby on the Way. Uh, so I don't know when this will uh, post will go out, but 
Um, we have a baby boy arriving in April and I know that parenting is a really big thing for you, which I think is so cool. And, um, we're excited about that. But, um, if we were looking to start a site, um, from scratch, that would be a great, um, niche to start in would be like, how do you create really healthy food for a growing baby or even pregnancy, right? Like how do you, um, have healthy food for pregnancy or for a baby? Like, Obviously, you get out of that stage, but there will always be babies and parents interested in like loving and caring for their kids in the best way possible. Um, and that would be a great niche to get into um, if you're just getting started out. That's awesome. Well, two big takeaways I'm hearing there. One is just that <clears throat> to find your niche, it's often helpful to overlap two things. So for you, it was foods and recipes, but it was also the business or the lifestyle or, mm-hmm. of food blogging which is like a, an interesting intersection. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, uh, the other one is just evergreen, just because you might create a site or get really passionate about the newborn uh, for, for the next year, that content, there's newborns born every day forever. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for sure. Like, I'm, you know, I sell learning software and there's always people trying to teach things. It's yep. not to go away. It's an evergreen topic. So mm-hmm. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Going evergreen is helpful. Well, why did you decide ultimately you ended up creating a food blogger pro is yep. that, and that's a community uh, for food bloggers, a, a membership that has courses in it. But where did that come from in terms of why didn't you just keep blogging and figuring out how to monetize your blog? Why did you end up also building a community? Yeah. I think the biggest thing was like the, 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 easiest way for us to expand into other areas has been just like keeping our ear to the ground and like what are the consistent rhythms and patterns that we hear and the interactions that we have and then creating um a solution for that right it's like find a need fill a need um there's a podcast interview that i did um we have a food blogging podcast just called the food blogger pro podcast and um we were interviewing it was a couple from steamy kitchen so steamykitchen.com and uh they were talking about different ways that that they are looking to you know build their business and that was the the phrase they use find a need fill a need um and scott and jaden hair are their names and the uh, same thing applies to us and so what we did is we had pinch of yam that was growing we were building that and we heard this consistent rhythm and pattern from people that were asking us questions about really specific things with the blog right how do you do xyz like how do you um how do you format your recipes in a way that they show rich pins on Pinterest, right? So these really specific niche questions. Um, And it's like, we could create resources within Pinch of Yum and do that, but we were already and still do feel a little bit of dissonance with like that first and foremost is a food blog. And 99% of the people that come there are coming for recipes. And if we are starting to like inundate that with like just blogging stuff, then it feels like, what is this? The identity is a little bit um, muddy in terms of understanding truly what it is. Um, And so it made sense for us to build this other brand, this other site, and technically a different business that is kind of a sister business or a sister site to Pinch of Yum. So the reason for creating it really came out of hearing this consistent need. Um, And the reason for spinning it off as a separate site was just because we knew we wanted to do it as a membership site. And like, if we wanted to give that its own personality and brand and presence, then we'd have to separate that. So then these could be two clean um, existences, if that's a word, on the uh, on the internet and as brands, and they could coexist and partner, um, but they they're not the same person, right? They're their siblings. That's awesome. Well, how'd you get your first people into the community? Yeah, we did a pre-sale three months before we launched the site. So our pre-sale went like this: we had um, people that followed along on Pinch of Yum that we knew were food bloggers. So that's where we launched it. And we did a launch post and we had three different tiers. I'm not saying this is the best way to do it, but maybe some people will get some ideas from it. It worked okay for us. Um, And we pre-sold a one-year membership to Food Blogger Pro and we incentivized the signups by having the price increase as it got closer. So if you signed up three months in advance, this was before we had the content, before we launched the site, um, it was $49 for one year. And then the next month it was 79. And then the month after that is 129. We just collected those. We used eJunkie and collected via PayPal. So it was a super simple process to collect those payments. Um, and then when we launched, we emailed those, I think it was, um, 
maybe 100 to 150 people. Um, we emailed out a login and they jumped in and started to go through the content and, and be members of the site. Um, so that's how we started it and launched it. And after that, we went to just a straight open period where people could sign up if they wanted to. Um, we experimented with like a $1 free trial where people could sign up and they could be um, go through a trial. At this point, what we're doing is we're doing an enrollment period. So we're like, we got to the point where there's enough people signing up and like integrating into the community, um, asking questions that maybe had been asked before. Um, and to us, it felt like kind of disrupting things a little bit that we wanted to shift away from that and really focus on doing enrollment periods where we'd have this new quote unquote class of people joining. Um, and that would in and of itself have more of a rhythm where we could welcome them in and give them attention as they joined. The other thing that's nice about that is it allows you to have a marketing rhythm. Mm -hmm. So you're, you have these periods where you can really um, talk openly and consistently uh, about enrollment. And before it was like, Cal, are we always going to push signing up for this? Or would it make sense to not push to sign up for it as much, to offer free content, to do a podcast, um, and then occasionally say, hey, we'd really love for you to sign up for Food Blogger Pro. So that's what we're doing at this point, And that's worked really well for us. How often, how many times a year do you open it up for new enrollments? Yep. So we have a waiting list and we do two really big, we call them public enrollments. We talk about it on the podcast. We post on Pinch of Yum. We post about it on Food Blogger Pro. We loop in the affiliates. Um, they do really big promotions. In between those, we do two private enrollments, which is a very short window that we offer to people on the waiting list. So the reason for that is we don't want to inundate the people that aren't interested with content around Food Blogger Pro. So we do that twice a year. Um, we want to cast that broad nest, uh, net occasionally um, because it's important to get the people in that, that aren't aware of it. But uh, we also want to make sure that people that are interested in it and they're on the waiting list that they don't have to wait like six months to get in. So that's why we do those intermediary private enrollment periods um, just to the waiting list. That makes sense. And what's, is it lifetime access or is it? Or is yep. It so the, uh, yep. No, it's not. That was yep to your question. No. Uh, as a response, the membership is structured in a way where you can sign up for monthly. So $29 a month or yearly two seventy nine dollars a year. Gotcha. Um, that's really interesting. Well, what about, how do you keep people engaged or how do you build a strong yeah, community? Like sure. so people are going to, if they're going to be getting monthly build or yearly build, yeah. what's your secret sauce to building a strong community based on your experience? It's hard. It's really hard with content-based sites because people aren't using it as a tool that they hook into their business, right? It's not QuickBooks where yeah. uh, if you close down QuickBooks, like that's a really, really big change, right? With content-based stuff, you're kind of relying on people's motivation to apply that content. Um, and especially if, you know, in, in our case, like we're sending out a re receipt every month and saying, Hey, we build you again. Like just a reminder. Um, it's really easy for people to say, oh, I'm not using it. I'm going to go in, I'm going to cancel. So for sure it's a difficult thing. Our churn rate ends up being anywhere, depending on the month, um, between monthly and yearly, like 10 to 12%, which is, um, I would, you would probably know better than I would. I would say that's maybe average. Um, I'm not sure on that one. Okay. Um, I've heard as high as, 20% uh, quoted as the average for a churn rate. But I also know that in the SaaS world, like software as a service, they would say, you kind of want to shoot for like three or 4%. But SaaS would be more of like the QuickBooks. So there's kind of this in between where if you're somewhere in between there, you know, the, the 5% to 20% for a membership site, um, I would assume that would be pretty good. 20% is kind of hard to maintain because you have so many people leaving every month. Um, so our biggest... Uh, thing has just been doing whatever we can to provide consistent value towards the question that the primary questions that people have. Um, and we do that in three different ways. Um, the first way is we do a live Q and a every month and we use crowdcast to do that. That's been a really great way to source questions, to do a live Q and a every once in a while we'll invite people on and they get to interact on that, on that, um, uh, convert or, or on that live Q and a, which has been a great, way to do that. We do a lot of times we do that on a specific topic and occasionally have special guests on for that. Um, the second thing that we do is I, I do a once a month happening now video and the happening now video is kind of like if you and I, Chris were to be at a coffee shop and you'd be like, Hey, what's happening now with your business? And I'd be like, here's a few cool things. Um, and talk about the stuff that I've been doing in the past month. Um, or just, in terms of, 
just in terms of pinch of the pinch of yum site. Both. Yeah. Actually, I think people are interested in both, right? So if we do a marketing campaign for food blogger pro, even though it's talking about the site that they are a part of, I think people can get a lot out of that. So like, so it's behind um, the scenes, like this is what's happening. Exactly. Yep. Um, so an example would be, um, something as simple as I talked about using, um, a new, uh, like screen capture tool. Um, and I talk about how I'm using that or maybe how I'm using like videos to communicate better with teams or talk about like when we started using Slack, I talked about that. Um, but also bigger picture things like, Hey, there's this really big change for SEO that impacts recipe blogs or like, here's an advertising change that we made super small things. But as you and I know, like as business owners, when we have those coffee shop conversations, a lot of times those are the things that are like make a huge impact on the business, super right? Super valuable, yeah. They're super valuable and um, it's just a snippet of information. So this is opening up that opportunity for people that don't usually have that opportunity because they don't have people that they sit down with at a coffee shop. You've been doing this for a number of years, you have connections, you know that you could maybe, you know, ping somebody on email or Slack or, you know, jump on a call. If you're just getting started out though, you probably don't have those connections. So this is a way to do like a virtual coffee shop conversation with people. So that's the happening now course. Um, and then we do a course, like an actual um, course that we do once a month. And that's 10 to upwards of 20 videos um, that are three to five minutes long, focusing on a wide range of topics. Uh, right now we're focusing in on video. So as you know, if you scroll through video, you see these like uh, videos of here's how to make, um, you know, cheese hot dog rings you know, and it's BuzzFeed doing like this viral video on um, cheesy hot dog pretzel rings, you know, that you can feed your dog. Um, and so, but, but that's a really important thing for bloggers, both on Instagram and Facebook. So that we're focusing in on that. Like, how do you create those videos? And we have somebody on our team that is a, um, that is shooting those and editing those. So she's taking on those courses, communicating our process along the way. Uh, so that's the other way that we add value and help people um, stick around. A couple little snippets for people to take away. We always include the upcoming um, content in the emails that we send to people, letting them know that they were charged. So like, hey, just a reminder, you're charged today. Here's the upcoming courses that we have, the three next things, as well as the three past things with a link to those. Um, just so people know the type of content that, that we're producing as a reminder, here's the value and here's where you can get that. Um, and then we also have that on the accounts page. So when people go to the account pa accounts page, managing their membership information, they have upcoming content as well as the past content that, that's been delivered. Um, and I think that's a valuable thing for people um, to consume and, and to be aware of, um, especially in this context when it's content-based stuff that requires people to consume the content in order to get value from it. Well, thanks for that, Bjork. That's a goldmine of uh, value there in terms of how to create recurring value in a content-based business. Um, it's not about crossing your fingers with a lifetime membership, hoping people uh, don't churn or, or unsubscribe yeah. or, or cancel their membership. That's like a real strategy to add recurring, repeatable uh, value every single month with a, with a system that you're not necessarily doing it all alone, but just to reiterate, that's a, a live, what I call office hours yeah. type monthly one to many call. And then you have a new course every month. And then you have a behind the scenes, which is, a, I like that. That's a really unique one behind the scenes um, video. Yeah. Content. And it's super simple. It's like 10 to 20 minutes long. And it's, you know, people can't see this because it's a podcast, but it's like you and me here chatting. Um, except I'm just chatting to the screen. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so it's a little image of me and then a recording of my screen. We use ScreenFlow for that, to record that. Um, super slick and uh, it's, it's a fun thing to put together and a good thing for me to do every once, once a month to like review like, hey, what are the things that we're doing and implementing and making sure that we're staying on top of that so we have stuff that we can communicate to people. Well, on this podcast, we have over 100 episodes here at LMS Cast. I could literally never run out of things to talk about. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Courses and membership sites. But if I'm a course creator and mm -hmm. I'm now considering, okay, if I'm going to launch a new course every month, that's a little more challenging because that's, I mean, there's a lot of, could be a lot of lessons. and Yeah, and, for sure. But how do you, A, not run out of 
um, ideas for new courses and B, how do you choose what to do next for a yeah. monthly new course? I think our niche is a little bit interesting because there's, there we'll never run out of ideas for a course because essentially what we're doing is we're taking all of the different elements of building a business online and like reskinning it and applying it to specific, Your niche. this niche. Yeah. Right. So like Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, accounting, um, you know, SEO, all of those things can be applied to our niche and it realistically are very different. Like yeah. it's not like we're just replacing food blog whenever we say blog, like right. there are very specific things that you would do differently than you would with like a normal generic content site. So in some ways it's a little bit easier for us because that type of content will never run out. The important thing for me has been, I don't want to pretend to be an expert on everything. So it's not like I'm, I don't want to get to the point where like I'm learning something in order to teach it. Right. So there are times where we bring in people that have an expertise in a certain course or a certain, uh, that have an expertise in a certain subject that then teach that course. And sometimes what we'll do is we'll even lease a course. Like somebody might have a course that, that exists somewhere else, like, um, on another like course site, or maybe they have their own site that they're, that they're, that they have this course that lives under. And what we'll do is we'll lease that knowing that it's not like we're stealing customers from them because the people that we're serving wouldn't go to them probably. And then we pay them, you know, usually a, a yearly recurring fee. Um, whatever that might be, you know, $100, $200 to have this course that we then have internally within our content um, on a specific subject. So an example would be Active Campaign, which is the email service provider we use. I, I know enough to do what we need to do within it, but I'm not going to be able to teach people on it. And it wouldn't make sense for me to learn that and then apply it. So um, our, yeah, our niche is a little bit unique in that um, we can always have this unending supply of content. In terms of deciding what's next, we, it's, it's that ear to the ground thing. It's like, what are people requesting and where it's the need? Um, and we hear that through the forum, right? So we have a forum where people interact in a community and we're able to, um, not formally, like we're not taking a you know survey every month, uh, but just naturally, it's like anything. It's like, you know, if the Minnesota twins are doing really well. Like you start to hear people talk about it and that conversation bubbles up and you're like, Oh, lots of people are interested in the Minnesota twins. Terrible analogy. But if uh, lots of people are talking about um, recipe plugins on the food blogger pro forum, we know that there's something there um, and that people are interested in that there's a need because that's naturally what rises to the top conversationally. So then we address that need by creating content around that if possible. That's awesome. And just to give people an idea, um, there are, people out there that license their courses. Like for example, Sean from WP 101, you can yeah. license his course on WordPress basics. It's phenomenal. He keeps it up to date. Um, every time there's a new release of WordPress and we, we actually use, we actually license his course WP 101 and we have a word, a free WordPress basics course on our site. Uh, but I didn't, I didn't have to, I know a lot about WordPress. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to create that course because Sean is, has the best course out there yeah. and he has a licensing deal. It's all automated. You go buy it, you get the videos and then you're off to the races. Yeah. I think that's such a big takeaway to not do it alone. Um, yeah. That's been a huge part for us. That's I would say in the last year and a half, the biggest thing for us has been building out a team, um, which is easier said than done, right? Like there's a point where people are just happy to be creating an income from what they're doing. But naturally what will happen is like, you'll continue to build on that. And as you improve, um, you'll naturally have more things to do, the more successful you are. Um, and I would encourage people as, as quickly as possible to figure out ways, it doesn't have to be full time, but even to bring somebody in um, 10 hours a week. And maybe it's somebody that's, um, their primary job or interest is staying at home with their kids, but they have 10 hours a week, um, you know, over nap time or um, after kids go to bed to dedicate to helping out with some stuff. And so you're able to bring this person on to help manage whatever it would be, customer support, um, social media, things like that. Um, as quickly as you can, I would encourage people to get to like what their salary equivalent would be. And then don't spend above and beyond that, but then put back into the business in order to grow. It's, it'll be a huge thing. And sustainability is important in this industry as we talked about at the beginning. And that's one of the best ways to be, um, uh, to continue to do what you're doing to sustain yourself is to build a team around, uh, around what you're doing. Absolutely. Well, let me ask you a question around, um, community. Mm -hmm. So there's this, I'm sure you've heard the, the saying that 
people come for the content, but they stay for the community. Sure. Yeah. Are you doing, sounds like you have a forum. Yep. What else do you do to foster community? Do you have a Facebook group? Do you do other things? No, we don't have a Facebook group. We did for a while and it was kind of a sharing Facebook group. So like people would share content they wanted other people to share and, you know, I scratch your back, you scratch mine. Um, but what we realized is it just would, it, it got too much to manage. Um, and we wanted to house everything in one area um, and really focus in on that. So the form that we have is on Food Blogger Pro. It's not a, a different site. It's not a Facebook group. Um, and the other thing that allows us to do is uh, to use that content to build the community stronger. So for example, there might be a long conversation thread on somebody that's starting to do video in, the, in ways that they've been able to do that successfully. If that lived within Facebook, it's a little bit harder to bubble that content back up or to find that content or really to um, internally share it. So we've really focused in on growing the community just on Food Blogger Pro, not in other places. Um, so, uh, and, and the ways that we, that we do that and the ways that we really lean into the community is we have somebody on staff that manages the forum full time. So Alexa is awesome and uh, is really focused on like, how do we focus in on this community, make sure that everybody's getting the questions answered that they need answered. Um, and her like supporting cast is what we call the Food Blogger Pro experts. So we have a, um, we call it a panel of people that work in a specific industry and are either, uh, you know, entrepreneurs that are built a business, solopreneurs, industry experts, consultants, um, that would have some type of vested interest in connecting with people in our industry, but also potentially have some time that they can dedicate to helping the community. So, um, you know, Casey Marquis, for example, he's an SEO professional. He comes in and he answers questions specific that people have about SEO. Um, or we have um, somebody that focuses on design and development. And Lauren comes in and, you know, she answers questions that people have about um, you know, their, their WordPress design or pl a plugin problem that they're having. Um, and then if people are interested in working with her, they go to, you know, her site, which is oncecoupled.com and they work with, with her in a, you know, kind of support or IT role. Um, so the, so that's been a really big shift that we've had as well. And, and a big movement for me away from being the expert, because one of the things I realized is like, I can't be the expert on everything, especially if we're going to get to a growth point where, I'm investing in our employees and our staff as opposed to continuing to be the expert on every single thing. So that, that's been a really important shift that we had within the past year and a half. That's awesome. Well, lots of great takeaways, Bjork. If you guys that are listening want to hear more about this and see, see the, what's going on here, go to pinchofyum.com and then that's the blog and then check out the membership site, which is called foodbloggerpro.com. If anybody wants to connect with you or find out more, where else can they get in touch with you? Bjork? For sure. Uh, I am not active on Twitter, but I see replies. So okay. if uh, somebody wants to tweet at me, uh, it is Bjork Ostrom. And that would probably be the best way. Just open up a conversation there and uh, we'd love to connect. Awesome. Well, thank you for coming on the show. And I really appreciate you sharing so much. And uh, thanks for being a shining example of how to you know, put in the hard yards, do the work, and then uh, build a team and build a, a strong community and, and online education business. That's awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Super fun to chat.